We are back with another episode of the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. We are joined by Dr. Majdi Islam. Dr. Islam is a board-certified urologist practicing with St. Louis Urology in both Missouri and Illinois. He is passionate about men's sexual and general health and has published and presented on various topics. One of those areas is male infertility. On today's episode, we want to learn more about male infertility and how it can impact sexual function and erectile dysfunction. Dr. Islam, thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate you having me on, Mark. Appreciate you. Okay, so to get us started, can you just share with our listeners a little bit about your practice? Sure, absolutely. So I am a uh, male health urologist. So I did a urology residency and then I did a special training with a fellowship in uh, basically men's reproductive medicine and and uh, and surgery, which essentially entails uh, erectile dysfunction, basically all sorts of sexual dysfunction, which is erectile dysfunction, um, low testosterone, infertility, Peyronie's disease, things of that nature. And then I do things like vasectomy and vasectomy reversals. And so, um, you know, a big part of my practice is kind of like Mark, what you entailed is erectile dysfunction as well as uh, infertility. And so a lot of the cases that I see are from both of those ends, from an erectile function standpoint, from just giving guys medications all the way through the more invasive medications to doing the surgeries, the implants. And then from an infertility standpoint, starting from the beginning in terms of doing a workup for infertility uh, with labs and exam imaging, all the way up to doing specific types of procedures and surgeries to help guys be able to get to the point where they can uh, they can father a pregnancy, whether that's naturally versus uh, versus through what's called ART or assisted reproductive technologies or therapies. Okay, we're going to learn more about those um, in just a couple moments. So before we actually discuss male infertility, can you give our listeners like a basic overview of what the male partner role is in the fertility process? In other words, what exactly is the male side necessary for? And that can kind of give us a sense of where things might not be working as well or could go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, you bring up a really important point in, point in that, you know, with infertility, there is a male side as well as a female side where a lot of times the male side can potentially be unfortunately overlooked. And so, you know, up to 50% of couples that go through infertility have a male component. And so it's important to note that that's something that's in uh, imperative to look into when a couple is going through issues with fertility. And so along those lines, there's different things that co- that can go into men and their fertility which include erectile function, you know, ejaculation, the semen quality itself in terms of, you know, sperm number and count and quality, um, and then kind of a combination of all of the above. Okay. So, so kind of as a quick overview, so the male process obviously requires, you know, not necessarily naturally requires an erection and um, ejaculation of um, semen, which contains sperm. Um, and those sperm, I would assume have to be of, of high enough quality to be able to fertilize an egg. Is there anything else that's missing in that basic overview that could be a key or, or potentially problematic if it isn't present? Yeah. So basically it's a great overview. Basically the idea of being able to achieve pregnancy is you have to be able to have an erection. You have to be able to ejaculate. You have to have enough ejaculate to be able to come out to house the sperm. And then you have to have enough sperm that are not only present in number, but also present in quality. When I say quality, I mean um, the the sperm movement, what we call motility, also the sperm shape and size, which is morphology. And then there is even more detail into that in terms of how well it moves, if it's moving forward, if there's any DNA damage to that sperm. So there's a lot of things that go into looking at that sperm to see what potentially could be not allowing it to get from point A to point B to be able to fertilize an egg, which is the entire process of from ejaculation to fertilization. I'm yeah. sorry, from erection to fertilization. So, so, so to that end, I mean, it sounds like sperm would have a pretty uh, large role. I mean, the quality of the sperm and the motility of the sperm would have a large role. What percentage of male infertility cases that present are presenting with an issue of sperm as opposed to an erection or an ejaculatory issue? So the, the definition of a male infertility is when a couple has had, has attempted intercourse uh, for a year and been unsuccessful with fathering a pregnancy. And so with those men, 
the first question I always ask is, what is your erectile function? How is How are your erections? Are you able to get an erection every time that you want to? Are you able to achieve penetrative intercourse when you want to? And then when you know, you guys are ovulating or when your spouse or partner is ovulating, are you able to get to the point where you can have an erection and ejaculate when you need to? And so I think an important part of that is not just, can you have an erection and can you ejaculate, but can you do it when, you know, quote unquote, the pressure is on, you know, when the ovulation cycle is there, because that's, I'm sorry, ovulation window, because that's an important part of it. Um, not to not to beat around the bush to answer your question, but a big part of being able to um, achieve all of that is is mental as well. Meaning there can be a lot of pressure on guys whenever that ovulation uh, window rolls around where they have no issues with getting erections otherwise or no issues with getting to orgasm otherwise. But man, when that window comes on, um, it really does cause some stress to decrease the ability to get an erection or decrease the ability to be able to get to orgasm. So it's a tough question to answer. There's a good portion of men that have issues with infertility that have a combination of all the above. And so I think it's a, there's, there's some studies that look into that specific number and percentage, but it's actually usually a combination of all of the above that contribute with a little bit more, uh, to be totally honest, more more of a percentage from a sperm function issue. Dr. Ism, can you help clarify just the, the difference between sperm, um, and semen and how that process all kind of comes together. Absolutely. So, you know, when a man ejaculates, uh, the the ejaculate, which is the liquid that comes out, that's going to be called semen. And so semen itself is a combination of fluids that are coming from the prostate, from the glands, from certain glands that empty into the urethra, into the pee channel, all the way up to the sperm that is in the uh, ejaculate as well. And interestingly, the I'm sorry, the sperm itself is a pretty small amount of the ejaculate. It actually takes up about um, well less than two percent, less than one percent of the ejaculate. Usually, 0.2 cc's of the ejaculate itself is sperm. Meaning, sperm being um, the actual entities that are going into the uh, into the cervix into the fallopian tubes to be able to fertilize the egg individually are what is important for fertilization, whereas the semen itself is everything together. So long story short, sperm is individually what carries the DNA to be able to go up and fertilize the egg, but there are millions and millions of sperm in the ejaculate itself in a man that has a normal amount of uh, of uh, ejaculate and of sperm. So, so millions of sperm, which make up really a small, tiny fraction of the ejaculate. That's correct. Uh, and so as you can imagine, there's, there's certain ways that that could be an issue if, you know, you don't have as much sperm in the ejaculate or if something is obstructing the ejaculate from being able to come out completely, um, meaning you have less volume of ejaculate, or if that sperm, which only one is able to make it all the way up to fertilize the egg, if the sperm isn't moving well enough forward to be able to make it from the vaginal cavity where, you know, the ejaculate is dropped off all the way up to the egg where it has to go into the cervix and up towards the fallopian tubes. And so it's got a journey to get to where it needs to go. And there can be quite a few things that can get in the way of that happening. In the world of fertility, is there a specific starting point? If a couple comes in and they are actively trying for that, that year and um, they have not been able to conceive, is there a starting point between male and female is you mentioned it's about 50% or up to 50% could be coming from the male partner. Um, are both uh, partners examined equally? Is there a starting point? How does this process unfold? It's a great question. So usually whenever a couple uh, has been trying for a pregnancy again for a year, that's when we consider them to be quote unquote infertile and to where it's indicated to do uh, an evaluation. Usually we would like to see both couples go through the evaluation simultaneously, meaning if it's been a year and that year mark, uh, as a side note is, you know, what we again, considered, uh, an amount of time that's long enough to ideally be able to get a pregnancy going. There's plenty of couples that seek care sooner at six months or four months or whenever to get a checkup, but ideally simultaneously having both parties get an evaluation. So for a female to go to a, um, either an OBGYN or a reproductive specialist, a female reproductive specialist, and for men to see a urologist or ideally a men's health specialist or an andrologist. 
And so getting that work up at the same time is important because again, there's a very good likelihood that there is potentially a male component as well as a female component or one or the other. So Dr. Eslin, what what is the process for diagnosing male infertility? How how is this assessed? Sure. So once you head, you know, when a man heads to the urologist or the men's health specialist, basically the most important part of this is doing a history or taking a good history, doing a physical exam, but most importantly, getting getting a semen analysis. And so I'll hit on that semen analysis in just a second, but for the physical exam and a, and a history, you know, the things that are important are finding out, you know, the obvious things like, are you getting an erection? Are you able to ejaculate when you get an erection? You know, is the ejaculative volume changed in the last few years? Things that surround the idea of is intercourse during the time that your spouse is ovulating something that you're able to do and able to do appropriately. Um, there are certain things, you know, from a lifestyle standpoint, which we'll talk about, we can talk about uh, later that we would ask for as well. Things that are obvious, like smoking and, you know, drinking alcohol and things that can get in the way, but also things that aren't as obvious, like sitting in hot tubs for longer periods of time that we'll ask about as well. A physical exam we do to take a look at the testicles because testicle size matters. Um, there's something called a varicocele um, that can contribute potentially to uh, cause the sperm not to function as well that we look for um, on the exam as well. And then the semen analysis specifically is basically where a, a man ejaculates. We take that ejaculate and stick it under a microscope and then take a look and see what the sperm look like. And so in the ejaculate, the volume, the amount of sperm is important. Again, as well as what the sperm look like in terms of the size and shape of the sperm and what the shape of not, not only the, um, the head of the sperm, but also the tail and then the motility, how well the sperm is moving, if the sperm is moving forward, so that's called progressive motility, and overall getting an idea of what the quality of the sperm is like. And so that combination of the history of the exam and then the semen analysis is usually that first step to assessing a man's uh, overall fertility or getting a fertility evaluation. Yeah. yeah so, so I mean, an, I guess another way to, to, to look at this maybe is like you're assessing function, the anatomical structures and then the semen which which you know it needs to get out of the erection through the ejaculate and you want to assess the quality of all of those try to see where the problems might be that, that's a great great summary it's a great way to put it try and figure out if it's you know the tools that you're using are the issue or if it's the uh it's the the potential finishing uh aspect of the tools or of the uh of the of the process itself yeah um, I, I know that that uh, sexual education has a long way to go, and there are you know many people who are sexually active, um, potentially even trying to conceive without uh, basic working knowledge or even proper knowledge of the process they're engaged with. How common is it that a a couple will come in, or or you'll see the male partner who is experiencing, let's say, situational erectile dysfunction or uh, an ejaculation and um, is unaware that without the ejaculate, you're not going to be able to um, conceive. How, how common is this kind of situation? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's more common than you'd think. I'd say overall, it's, you know, it's, it's something that even the process in general of ejaculation, how often you can ejaculate, when to be attempting intercourse in terms of ovulation windows, you know, the fact that just like you mentioned, an ejaculate or ejaculation and orgasm are two separate entities. All of those are important parts of being able to get to pregnancy. And, and a lot of times, just like you mentioned, we do find that men, um, you know, they don't, they're not aware that all of these things have to happen in congruence or happen well or happen together to be able to get to pregnancy. And so, yeah, we definitely find occasionally during these office visits that we're having to sit down and, and talk to guys about the fact that just because you're getting an erection, feeling like you're having an orgasm doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing all the things that you need to be doing to be able to father pregnancy. And that's not to the, the fault or, or a, you know, detriment from a health standpoint to the guy, but definitely not again, to the fault of that man, because, you know, he's never been in a position usually where they've been trying actively to have a pregnancy. And then now is the first time where they realized, Oh my gosh, that's something that I feel like I should have known, but I didn't, which isn't, you know, an issue necessarily or to the fault again of, of that patient or that person. How common is it that a man goes through one of these um, evaluations, 
and reports totally normal sexual function, erection, ejaculate, and then learns that um, sperm has a motility issue, let's say, for example. How often does something like that lead to sexual dysfunction once a man has learned that um, his sperm is not of high quality or is not doing what it's supposed to do? Yeah, it's a it's it's a it's an important point you touch on because it it, it happens quite often. Um, and as I'm sure you would imagine, you know, erectile function is something that men you know hold pretty near and dear to their hearts. But also along with that, sexual function as well. So when a man hears that their sperm isn't up to par or their ejaculate volume isn't what it needs or what it could be or what it should be to be able to father pregnancy, you know, unfortunately again, not by any fault of their own or anything that they've done from a lifestyle standpoint, it causes them to feel unfortunately inadequate. And then it's interesting in that the, literally the, um, the, the anatomic or the physiologic thing that happens whenever you orgasm that gets rid of an erection, basically you have what's called vasoconstriction, the blood vessels start to, um, get nice and small and keep blood flow from going to the penis that happens because of, of uh, basically of hormones that are released essentially. So the stress hormone essentially that, that that's getting released. But when a man has those thoughts that are going on in their heads that, you know, there's a little, you know, a little something in the back of their mind, potentially gnawing at them, that stress hormone is, is out there potentially causing them not to be able to get as much blood flow to the penis. And there's a real physiologic effect of that quote unquote, it's in your head that happens that literally keeps guys from being able to get an erection or be able to maintain an erection. And so there really is a, an aspect of that that's real that we see quite often um, when a guy gets that diagnosis or finds out that, you know, for whatever reason, this quality, the sperm quality, sperm count, overall their fertility isn't up to par. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a distressing thing um, for many men when they, when they, when they discover that um, again, for no fault of their own, um, but that their sperm count is not high enough, there's motility issues and whatnot, it can really kind of speak to uh, just their sense of virility, masculinity and whatnot, and it can strike pretty deep. I really appreciate the way you just uh, spoke about, you know, the psychogenic or the psychological components of ED, because oftentimes, you know, it's a hard thing to explain in such clear and concise ways. I'm just wondering if you can go over that one more time for our listeners, just in terms of this real mind-body connection between, you know, the things that you think and how that actually impacts the release of hormones leading to constriction of blood flow. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I put it in pretty simple terms. I, you know, it's obviously a bit more complicated than that, but the idea, the long and short of it is whenever a man gets an erection, um, when they get to orgasm or they ejaculate, you know, obviously what happens next is they usually lose their erection pretty quickly. And that's because the blood vessels that are bringing in or pumping uh, blood flow to the penis are nice and dilated. Those then become constricted or smaller. And so the, essentially the, um, the, there's certain, substrates or hormones that are released in the body, essentially that's something similar to the stress hormone that then causes those to vasoconstrict those blood vessels. So whenever a, a man is having overall certain issues from a um, uh, overall stress st- standpoint, and that could be anything from, you know, worrying about being able to get an erection, worrying about the fact that they're not having issues with, or that they're having issues with fertility all the way to worrying about you know, that day at work or something of that nature, whenever there's any kind of stress around, there's a little bit of that same thing that's floating around in the bloodstream that can cause patients to not have the complete vasodilation that they need to be able to get an erection. And so that mind-body connection, you know, is unbelievably important, meaning that whenever a man has things that are going on in their mind, um, that they can literally physiologically, physiologically contribute to a man not being able to have have an erection, maintain an erection, get to orgasm. And so, you know, whenever somebody comes in and says, oh, it's all in my head, or when somebody is told it's all in their head, it, you know, irks a lot of us men's health specialists because, you know, it's not true. It's not all in your head because there's a real anatomic component to that mind body connection that contributes. And so I think that's really important. That's a good point to hit on again. Yeah. Yeah. I really, really appreciate that. Um, now when, when, uh, you deliver that news to some of these patients that that there's um, you know something going on with the sperm. And we'll we'll come to treatment in just a moment. But 
Um, how do you provide just support and understanding for just the impact on sense of masculinity, adequacy? Um, what are the, some of those conversations like? Yeah, so it's, it's you know, of course, it's a difficult conversation to have. And so, you know, I probably spend the most time to be totally honest with my infertility couples than I do with any other patient, because it's something that really, truly, you know, begs for or needs a conversation um, with a lot of, you know, therapy involved with it. And, and th- by therapy, I mean, you know, discussions about what the options are, next steps, but also about really talking to the patients, talking to the guys in particular and saying, hey, this is something, again, that is of no fault of your own. There's nothing that you could have done to keep this from happening. But it's something, I think it's important to note that it's something that is not uncommon that we see in plenty other men and that has potential treatments for, because I think it's important for those guys to know, again, that it's it's there's nothing that could have prevented it from happening, but that they're not alone. And there's many, just like erectile function, there's many other men that are their age that it happens to, because I think the difficult part about this is, you know, it's a young man's disease because most men that are interested in fertility are younger men. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult for a guy that usually has no other um, health problems or anything like that, that they've ever been through. This is the first time they've been told that they have a health issue or that they're going through something that is not normal. And then the other issue also is, usually this is something that they haven't talked to their to their friends about to their buddies you know even their their friends wives or anything of that nature and so this is really the first time that they're saying these things out loud to someone that's not their spouse or their family and so i think just that that ability to talk to someone openly about it is helpful as well so you know to dance around your question a little bit um usually it dep- i you know i take quite a bit of time to be able to talk to those patients about all of the above, but also just being there and being someone to be able to talk to um, is important for those patients, the couples, not just the men as well. Yeah. I mean, that support is is such an important thing because like you're, you're highlighting there's so much isolation. There's so much shame, embarrassment that comes with these things that it's, it's a really hard conversation for many people to broach, even with their trusted healthcare providers. And absolutely. Yeah. Now, Dr. Islam, how is male infertility addressed in, in particular you know, when it comes to erectile dysfunction and ejaculatory disorders? I think that 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 you know those are those are things that we do have a better understanding. When it comes though to um some of the things maybe on the anatomical side and or on the sperm side, um, you had begun to mention a treatment towards the beginning of the episode, but what what happens at that point when the problem has been identified? Sure. So, you know. It- Depends on the problem, obviously, but, you know, for example, if a, if a man, um, well, I'll, I'll start with the latter. If a guy has some anatomic issues, for example, the varicocele. So varicocele is when a man has dilated veins that sit on top of the testicle. Um, you know, it happens to guys, actually 40-ish percent of men have varicocele. So it's very common. However, um, a minority of men with varicocele have issues with fertility, meaning have an issue where the varicocele we're not sure if it's the, the pressure or the temperature from those dilated veins cause the sperm to not be as modal or the number of sperm not to be as high as, as ideal um, or cause potentially DNA uh, damage or DNA fragmentation to the sperm. And so then the, the treatment for that is something called the varicocelectomy or a um, it's actually a microscopic surgery where it um, takes about 45 minutes or so where we make a small incision in the groin and then ligate those those vessels that are causing an issue. And usually, you know, it can take up to a year, but uh, it can help with improving those sperm numbers, including the quality and the count. Then if a guy has um, uh, issues with the sperm number for other reasons, there's things that we can do to go into the testicle itself and harvest the sperm. If the issue is the sperm being able to get out what's called obstructive azospermia, meaning if a guy has zero sperm, Um, in their ejaculate, but they're ejaculating a normal volume of sperm, we can do certain tests to find out whether or not it's because the sperm is in the testicle, but not making its way out, or if the the man is not making any sperm. So if there's um, the sperm in the testicle, we can go in and harvest the sperm. If the man's not making any sperm, which is called non-obstructive azospermia. So azospermia is no sperm, non-obstructive means there's nothing that's keeping it from getting out. Then we have to have a conversation with that guy where there could be some little tiny pockets of sperm in the testicle that we can go in and try and essentially try and find, but there's a chance that we may not find sperm. So that's usually the, um, 
kind of the the last case scenario where we're hoping that we find sperm if the man is making sperm. However, if they're not, sometimes we unfortunately have to talk to them about using donor sperm for things for for IVF or something of that nature. I mean, you so there's, there's, very... there, there's situations where where again, I would imagine this is somewhat on the rare side, but where there's no sperm production at all. Yeah, I apologize. So I should start from the beginning. And so basically the main, we're basically looking at from a semen analysis, whether they have sperm or no sperm. And so sperm uh, itself, if they've got sperm, we look at the sperm quality. And so there's a myriad, the myriad of things that we look at in a semen analysis include the number of sperm and then the motility of sperm as well as the shape. And so the number and the quality are the two main things we're looking at in a semen analysis. If the number is lower, um, not zero, but if it's lower, or if the number is normal and the quality is lower, there is um, certain things that we can try to do to improve those numbers, which include if there's a varicocele to repair the varicocele. Um, we check hormones on those patients, basically a blood draw to look at things like testosterone, but also pituitary, which is a um, an area in the brain, pituitary hormones, which are the hormones that the brain produces to communicate with the testicles uh, about testosterone and sperm production, and also something called prolactin, which is another hormone that's produced in the brain. But basically looking at those to see if there's any abnormalities. And if there are, we can often treat those abnormalities, especially if the testosterone is lower to improve the sperm numbers. And then um, if the sperm count is much lower, uh, meaning if it's uh, what we call oligospermic or 5 million or less, or if they're azospermic, which means that there's no sperm, then we start looking at the potential to have to go into the testicle and extract sperm. And if they're either oligo or azospermic, meaning there's not very much sperm that's coming out, in particular, if they're azospermic, which means there's no sperm, we'll oftentimes have to go into the testicle to extract that sperm. But the big question is if it's obstructive azospermia, which means the testicle is making sperm, but it's just not making its way out, or if it's non-obstructive azospermia, which is when the testicles unfortunately aren't making sperm and that's why they're not getting out. And so those two are different in that if there's sperm in the testicles and we see signs of that on the hormones, we can go in and extract it easily and there's not much question. However, in that situation, that couple is usually doing IVF because we're having to extract the sperm surgically. Unfortunately, if they have non-obstructive azospermia, which is when the testicle is not producing sperm and there's signs of that on the hormones, we have a conversation with the patients about the fact that we can try and go in microscopically to, microscopically to, to see if there's pockets of sperm that we can extract, but there's going to be some situations where there won't we won't find sperm and that we may have to use donor sperm with IVF in that situation. And so that's oftentimes a difficult conversation that we have to have where you know, they're, the patients are not only going through an, an a, a, um, what's called an ART or basically IVF uh, to have, be able to have a pregnancy, but also that there's a chance that we may not be able to use their sperm for that uh, IVF cycle. And so I know that's a long, but still somewhat brief summary about kind of the options and the treatments and how, <laughs> how that rolls. I apologize for not being, that, being as brief as I wanted to. No, no, no. I mean, it's, it, it's a very you know, vast topic, no question about that. Um, just out of curiosity, um, if there's a hormonal issue, you mentioned pituitary gland, you might, um, are there ways to jumpstart sperm production by rebalancing the hormones or is that, are we getting, question. yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit complicated. The idea basically to make it pretty simple, whenever the, um, whenever the testosterone is on the lower end, and the what's called the LH and the FSH levels, those are two pituitary hormones that are released to, um, to help with testosterone function and sperm uh, production, essentially. Um, whenever those levels are on the lower end and testosterone is also low, there's medications that we can use to try and increase the testosterone to help the testicles to potentially produce either more sperm or help with the sperm quality, improve the sperm's motility uh, and or overall function. And so there's a certain percentage of patients where the hormones come back and they're a candidate to be able to do that. Now, those are patients usually that have, that do have sperm production that either have just a slight, a somewhat lower amount of sperm production, meaning a sperm count or uh, a, a slightly lower percentage of sperm than usual that are moving or moving forward that wouldn't unfortunately apply to those patients that have azospermia or no sperm. 
Got it. Okay, that was like really, really informative. And uh, I think that kind of helps to clarify, but it sounds like there are a number of treatments that are available. And, and it really sounds like it really comes down to a proper assessment. So if a couple is going through infertility, instead of playing the blame game, it sounds like both partners really need to be properly assessed and evaluated. I have heard of situations where only one partner is willing to undergo an evaluation. I know that creates relationship conflict, um, but you know, Dr. Islam, based on what you're sharing, it sounds like a, a proper evaluation really includes both partners um, going through an infertility assessment uh, to really try to pin down um, what each partner's role may be in the process. Is that is that accurate? That's exactly right. It's extremely accurate. Yeah, it's extremely important. And, and just like you alluded to, oftentimes, you know, one partner goes through an evaluation, but the other partner doesn't. And oftentimes it's the male partner that doesn't. And so um, a lot of that, I think, comes from A, you know, stigma, but B, just the potential lack of, 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 of awareness that that's something that you should be doing. Because oftentimes when you hear infertility, you think, okay, you know, my wife needs to go and get, get, get worked up or get checked out. But you don't think about the fact that likely you should probably get checked out as well as the, as the male partner. So it's imperative that both parties, yes, uh, gets an evaluation, even if it's just a quick what we like to call a quick, you know, a well baby check to make sure that the semen's looking like it should. And even on top of all of those things, there's also lifestyle changes that are really easy to make that can improve the sperm numbers because it is actually extremely variable, even from one ejaculate to the next, what that sperm can look like and what the motility even can look like. And so simple things like, you know, making sure you're sleeping seven hours a night, eating healthy, um, uh, decreasing the potential, uh, uh, amount that you're eating, you know, high sugar, high salt stuff, and then, um, you know, stopping smoking or decreasing the amount you smoke, decreasing the amount you drink, you know, not sitting in hot tubs for long periods of time, because that can cause issues with motility. Um, and then, you know, including up to even taking fertility supplements, you know, things like that, that are easy, cheap, and, and, or lifestyle changes can really, really actually improve that sperm quality, you know, not to the extent of, um, making someone that has no sperm be able to have sperm, but enough to where it, it matters. Yeah. I, I just want to also just kind of wrap up by emphasizing this point that it really is not outside of these lifestyle changes um, or you know certain dis- lifestyle decisions. It really is not something that the man is doing wrong. But likewise, with the female partner, I mean, there's there's just certain realities of the human body and and the complexity of how it's made up. Um, and I know that a lot of men in particular hesitate to reach out for help, whether it's, you know, with erections or, you know, other physical ailments and certainly with, for you know, fertility, which is, you know, very much embedded, I think, in the psyche, you know, to reproduce. Um, that could be an area where I think men hesitate, but just, you know, Dr. Islam, hearing just how much is actually available um, and how many treatments there are at different stages of what could be causing infertility. To me, I find that, you know, very comforting uh, to know that just by reaching out for help, many of these issues can actually be resolved. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, to your point, again, um, it's, it's, it's never to the fault of either partner by any means. Um, but yeah, from a male, a male fertility standpoint, getting that evaluation is unbelievably important, but knowing that if there's an issue, there's nothing, you know, for the, usually that you could do that prevents that, or that could have prevented that. And, you know, being able to have the support of someone that, that is there for you, that's been through it before from a fertility standpoint, meaning someone that's guided other people through that process and, is there to talk to you about the options, talk to you about the things that you can do um, is really important through that process for both partners, because it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough thing to go through. And it's usually very, like we talked about very isolating, not only for the man, but for the couple in general, because couples in general, it's something that's difficult to talk about with other people. And so to your point, I think it's extremely important to do and to do um, with someone that you trust. Okay, Dr. Islam, thank you very much. It's been super informative. Uh, it kind of gives another angle on the male sexual psyche, both from an erection standpoint and also from a fertility standpoint. I think our listeners are going to benefit from hearing your insights. I also really like the way that you explain the psychogenic components, how there's overlap between those stress hormones, both from an anxiety perspective and a physiological perspective. It's going to be a really you know important highlight to get out there. So once again, thank you very much for your time. We look forward to having you again on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Appreciate you. 